Hello, I'm Dan Flynn, and you're now starting an eight-week series on a Bible study on community and 1 Corinthians. In your hands at this point, you should have a student worksheet, a handout that you can fill in blanks as I'm speaking, along with some discussion questions that can be used uh, before, after, and during the Bible study. And you'll see a worksheet for each of the eight weeks of the series, and you'll also hear uh, some ins an instructional video that aligns itself with the, the worksheet. Uh, I'm delighted that you've chosen to do the Bible study and that you're looking to explore the scriptures and be in the word, and particularly with the idea of community. Our congregation has a strong commitment to community. We, we want people to be very much embraced into community. And so as we look at our commitment to community, I, I think um, I would like to just break down the word a little bit on what community actually means, the word itself. If you look at the word community, you're going to see the word com and the word unity. And com comes from the Latin word and it means with. And of course, unity means unity. So with unity. So the whole idea of community means we are a people who are in unity. But you and I know that the word community is used so frequently and it doesn't mean that we're all in unity or that we're aligned, even aligned in going into any one direction. We can say that ultimately any group of people are considered a community if they have the basis of understanding of why their community exists. That's interesting. So we could say that there's some sense of unity if people understand why they actually are part of a community, that group, and why it exists. Interesting. When I was teaching years ago, uh, for 11 years, I taught at a Lutheran high school, and I, for all the time I was at this Lutheran high school in Baltimore, Maryland, I was the middle school basketball coach. Yes, I spent a lot of time with 12-year-olds. I won't say I was a very good coach, nor would I say they were very good athletes, but for 11 years, we had a good time playing basketball and me coaching. It was always interesting to me that during the season, the team had a purpose and a value. They spent an enormous amount of time together with me, and, and uh, they spent time with me, and I spent time with them. I got to know them really quite well. They got to know me really quite well. Uh, the community, we might say the team, the middle school team, was a type of community. We did had to, we had to work with unity because you had plays to run and a team to perform. What was striking to me in those early years of coaching, when the season was over, the unity went away because the purpose for our existence ceased. And then a year later, when the team came back together again, and most of those athletes did return, there we were again on the gym floor and that unity responded. But when the season's done, so also was the unity because the purpose for which the team existed was complete. There was unity as long as the season lasted. The Christian community is supposed to have a different value than say an athletic team. The Christian community doesn't have a season that begins and a season that ends. In fact, we would say the Christian community should be in unity because they have an eternity of purpose. We believers use the word community. It's part of our jargon. It's part of who we are. The words can lose value because they're used so frequently and we talk as if we're in unity, but then again, we're not in unity. And so part of the study today is to talk about what does it mean to be in a Christian community. Jesus said it this way in John 17, verses 20 to 21. You'll see the verses on the screen. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, that they may be one Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So oneness means something. 
By our oneness, the world knows something that we are distinctive in what we believe and in our purpose. Jesus goes on to say in verse 23 of chapter 17 of John, he says, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them. So our unity really is important. Our oneness becomes a statement to the broader world that lives in a fractured, polarized environment that they don't understand oneness. And we in the community of Jesus, we're to exhibit a different value. Jesus tells us that in John 17 in the high priestly prayer. God's delight is that we do not live in isolation, but that we share our lives together. So followers of Jesus who say that they're a follower, but don't believe that don't belong to a community are out of alignment with what scripture tells us God wants us to do. God's desire is that we be in unity in community. So it's with this understanding of community that we're actually doing an eight week series looking at faith community. We're going to walk through 1 Corinthians, and that's 16 chapters. We're gonna look through 1 Corinthians, and we're gonna look at our congregation in our own journey of being a Christian community. And for the Corinthian church, being a community was really messy. It wasn't easy, and we're gonna talk about that messiness. Now, right now, I'd like you to pause the video and I'd like you to spend just a couple of minutes talking about unity and disunity in your congregation. How does unity look in your congregation and how does disunity look in your congregation? So take a pause and when you come back, we're going to take a look at the backstory of the church in Corinth. Welcome back. I, I hope the conversation you had on unity and disunity was a stimulating one and not just a, a quick answer. To give you some backstory of the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul is actually the father of the church in Corinth. When we read the book of Acts, we know that the Apostle Paul did three very extensive missionary trips that he traveled around uh, Turkey, what we would know today as Turkey, in the New Testament it was called Asia Minor. So present day Turkey, and then he ultimately went into Greece. And at the end of his life, there's a fourth trip in the book of Acts, and that's called the prison trip. So three missionary journeys, and then a, a prison trip to Rome. That's his fourth trip. So he ends up in Italy, but he spends the vast majority of his time in Asia Minor, present day Turkey, and in Greece. And so that's what you're going to see with the majority of the epistles that he wrote in the New Testament. Around 50 AD, uh, Paul came to the city of Corinth. And when he came to Corinth, people did respond to his message and a congregation was established. So when Paul went into an area, what he would do is he would start at a synagogue and, and he would speak. Some of the Jewish people in the synagogue would come to believe what we know is that the majority rejected. Then he would go to the Gentile community, the non-Jewish community, and he would begin to speak. And he would preach to, that, to the Gentile community, and a bunch of them would come to faith. So he'd have Jewish people and Gentile people coming together in one congregation. He would appoint elders who would become the shepherds of that congregation. So in his tenure at that place, he would do the evangelism, create a congregation, appoint elders, and, and, and if he's there long enough, he, hope he's, he hopes he's there long enough, he can see that a good healthy foundation was established, and then he would go on to the next church. That's what he did at the church in Corinth. He would come to the city and he established a congregation. Now you're going to see a map of where Corinth is uh, in Greece today. Uh, Corinth, as you can see on the map, you'll see it located, Corinth was a large city. It had about 250,000, listen to the, the, the language, it's very interesting. There are 250,000 free people that lived in Corinth and another, and you can read about it, another 400,000 were slaves. So 250,000 free 
and 400,000 who were slaves. So you had a city that was majority were, were slaves who did the work and another, another 250,000 of people who owned those slaves. They were in, Corinth was located, as you can see in the map, in southern Greece. Athens was to the north of it. And if you remember, Athens was the Harvard of the ancient Greek world and really the hub of intelligentsia for all of the Roman Empire. You'll also notice on the map that Corinth is on an isthmus. And on that isthmus, you're going to see uh, there, there's one sea, the Iona Sea, and then on the other side of the isthmus is the Aegean Sea. And Corinth is right in the middle. The city is built on a four-mile piece of land. And that isthmus right there where Corinth built became extremely prosperous because the shipping industry would stop, they would stop at one side, the Aegean Sea or the Ionian Sea side, and they would actually unload their boats and they would carry the freight across four miles to the other sea. Or what was really interesting, if the boat was a small freighter, they would take the whole boat and stuff and all in the boat and they would haul it across that isthmus. There was no canal. As a result, the city became very prosperous. Why would you do such a thing? Because if you went around the bottom of Greece, the seas were very dangerous and it was cheaper to stop and unload a boat, carry it across to the other side than it was to sail around the bottom of Greece and come up on the other side. And so, so Corinth became very prosperous with that kind of shipping industry. In fact, there was a major trade route that came from the north of Greece, above Athens, went all the way down to the south, down to Corinth. So you had the shipping industry coming in by water and you had land trade coming in uh, across Greece that kind of stopped at Corinth. All of that created an extraordinarily wealthy city. The thing that Corinth became most well known for was the worship of the goddess Aphrodite. Again, you'll see a picture of Aphrodite on the screen. The goddess Aphrodite, note, note the word Aphrodite, meant the goddess of love. And there was a very, very large temple that was built above the city of Corinth. So it was the big landmark. When you came into the city, you could see the temple to the goddess Aphrodite. This goddess of love was a fertility cult. Now, a fertility cult in the ancient world means they worshipped by having sex. There were 1,000, hear this, 1,000 prostitutes that were connected to the temple of Aphrodite, both male and female prostitutes. The shippers that would come in, you can imagine all the industry that was coming into the city made the goddess Aphrodite very lucrative. There was a lot of prostitution. They would worship Aphrodite by going to the temple and actually having sex with the prostitute. In fact, Corinth Became, it became so well known. The prostitution became so well known in the Roman Empire. Get this. The word Corinthian began to mean, to say Corinthian meant to have intercourse with a prostitute. This was a highly immoral city. The result is the congregation that was started was, with, was filled with pretty immoral people. They were prostitutes, ex-prostitutes, ex-criminals. They were people that lacked a moral compass along with the others because there were others that were moral. So you had these people that had a very strong moral comp compass ultimately coming from the Jewish community and then you had the Gentile community that lacked a moral compass and they came together in one congregation. You can only imagine the substantial conflict that would naturally take place because of these two groups coming together. The strength of studying Corinthians, of studying 1 Corinthians, is that there was such a mess in the city of Corinth. The church was so conflicted that Paul had to instruct them in the fundamentals of being in community. And so chapter by chapter, we read Paul's instructions. This was not a happy congregation. This was an angry congregation. 
and they were even angry with Paul. They didn't understand what it meant to walk in community. They lost sight of why they were in community. And so the Apostle Paul writes a letter. In fact, he writes a couple of letters that all give explanation to what it means to be involved in a Christian community. So as we go through the next seven weeks, we're going to be reading the epistle and we're going to be looking at the various topics that Paul addresses that all have to do with a conflicted community. I think from their problems, we can look at our communities today and we can ask where we are as a congregation and what is God teaching us through the messiness of the church in Corinth and the writings of the Apostle Paul. So for our next meeting, I would like you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2. You're going to notice on your worksheet a little assignment. I want you to take a few minutes to talk through now what I shared today uh, about the backstory of Corinth and what caught your attention and what questions might you have from the lecture that I just gave. And then I would like you to do a prayer and ask God to encourage community among you and your small group. So thank you for listening to my first lesson, and I'm really looking forward to our seven weeks together.